I just want to say welcome uh, one and all, and I, I'm looking forward to the, the, the next couple of days uh, in relation to this. I'm not going to ramble on. I have a tendency to ramble on myself, and I had a long-winded speech to make, but time is gone, so I'll leave that till another, maybe a pint later on this evening. But I want to just uh, first and foremost um, say it is a seminal year. It is the 100th anniversary of the formation of the Irish state, and I'm going to begin because it, Ferrero was quoted earlier on by, uh, as an influence uh, for people. When he, when he was growing up, he, uh, as a young fella, he recognised uh, what distinguished him from his neighbours, uh, what made him middle class as opposed to working class or lower class was because where he lived in the room, uh, he had a bookshelf. His father put a bookshelf in and he had a bit of a piano in the corner. And he recognised uh, that his neighbours had none of these. Uh, but what he did say was, I shared their hunger, but not their class. And to me, the situation for travellers uh, is that we share your colour, but not your caste. And that's the situation for us for this last hundred years. There has been a form of de facto caste system, apartheid system, uh, that has been propagated from the very get-go from 1922, when the new state was formed, the othering process, uh, and that has led us to the situation we're in today. So, with further ado, I'm going to introduce the panellists. I just wanted to think about that anyways, and uh, I'll, I, we're going to have a, a really good uh, discussion. I know that. So, we have, on my left, we have uh, Dr. Aoife Branick. I'm going to go that and then back because uh, we have an addition, uh, uh, and I'm sure everyone knows uh, the man that's sitting beside <laughs> next to me. And if you don't, well... <laughs> so, we have Dr. Aoife Branick. Uh, she's an independent scholar. Uh, she published her, 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 her book, uh, uh, Becoming Conspicuous, in 2006, am I right, Aoife, in relation to uh, Irish travellers and, and the state, 1922 to 1970, which is, is, is quite apt as well. To her uh, uh, left is Owen de Bardoon, who is a... Um, God, Owen is a lot of things, but <laughs> <laughs> and he, he really is. So he is currently uh, uh, working in the uh, National Museum. He is the Traveller Culture Collections Development Officer there. He has published uh, 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 himself. He's a writer, activist, uh, co-founder of Tara, which is the LGBT Traveller and Roma Alliance, uh, and also uh, he has a focus on traveller folklore. So. Uh, each one of them will get the opportunity to, to give a little bit more about themselves as well. And then on, on the further left is Dr. Robbie McFay, uh, who is, uh, I've been following his stuff for a long time. Uh, he's a, uh, am I right, you lecture out of Edinburgh? No, I'm, I'm not an academic. Uh, right. <laughs> Fair enough. So, uh, but anyways, I, I got him to sign one of his books this morning, so... <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be a really uh, uh, great discussion. And then, finally, Vincent, uh, Vincent Brown. And as I said earlier on, sure, everyone must know Vincent in some way or another. Uh, and Vincent is going to partake uh, in the discussion, and, and uh, um, we'll get it going. So the way it's going to work is each one of the, the uh, uh, panelists is going to give a, a, a presentation, give or take, on a topic of their, of their interest. They've got roughly about six minutes, so Sarah said she's going to keep time. Uh, she'll have to do that. So, uh, uh, so each one is going to have about six minutes, and then we're going to have three specific questions to each one of those, and then we're going to kind of open it up for a bit of a debate. And I have a number of questions myself I'd like to ask them, but if I don't get them here, I'll get them later on. So anyways, Aoife, do you want to do, you want to do it from there? Do you want to step up here? No, right? no, well, I'm mic'd. Um, is the mic on? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Right, so I'll stay sitting. Uh, that's kind of how I thought it was going to be anyway when I saw the lecture and I was like, oh dear, I hadn't planned for that sort of talk, so this is actually better. Um, that's something Owen might talk yeah. about as well. Um, so I suppose uh, my work when I was studying travellers, it was travellers in relation to the state. When you're reading the, the documents and then bang, 1960s, suddenly it exists and everybody uses it, and it completely displaces um, the, the other words, which is mostly traveling people, travelers, or in Irish and luck shul. So, like, it just, it, it changes the discourse entirely. And I think it is part of that special category concept. Um, in this case, it's a much more reforming 
um, idea, the Commission on Itinerancy is attempting to create a new version of welfare, a national run rather than a local authority one. So it is trying to reform the poor law. Um, and so it is sort of a technical word almost, like it's a technical government word, and it comes from that place within government. Um, I just don't know why they needed a new word, really, because there was no need. I mean, everybody knew what travelers meant. Um, and I never found uh, you know, a memo or a discussion paper or anything explaining why this word was needed. Um, but I think it comes from a, a movement within government in the 60s as well. You can see that a lot of the government annual reports start to change their format. They leave behind, which is arguably a sort of Victorian format, and they become much more like what we would recognize today as sort of this sort of thing, as in literally looks like this. Um, whereas the layout and everything is much more uh, 19th century up until the 60s. So I think it's, it's a modernization project um, within social welfare as well. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure really, but that's, that's my speculation. In the, in the report itself, it acknowledges that travelers hated the word itinerancy, yet they persisted in using the word mm. itinerancy throughout the report, yeah. knowing that travelers hated it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's great. So uh, just before I move on to Owen and we'll get back into the bill, just I think it was Stokely Carmichael who once said that, you know, those who define are the masters. Mm. And I think that's, for me, the state was defining, making it categorically clear, this is what you are, uh, you're failed, you're settled, and we're going to address that. So I just think that's important in that sense. And I, I think it's as simple as that. And it's interesting when you say that there's no... Uh, no internal records. I wonder <laughs> why that might have been. On to Owen. Okay. Uh, so we've got Owen de Bardoon. You've got six minutes oh. or seven minutes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I probably won't hit more, but I just wanted to actually comment on something that you mentioned. Um, you mentioned the idea of the, you no, know, that, that's, I suppose, specific and special kind of social welfare considerations. Mm -hmm. I think most people don't realize that when Travers first engaged with those uh, state supports, uh, it was called the unemployability allowance. Mm -hmm. So the state had made a decision like that these, because as a community, we were unemployable. And what happened when that was phased out, it wasn't actually reintroducing people into the economic kind of markets and opportunities. People were transitioned to the disability allowance, mm -hmm. in which some people in this country still remain on. I think that's actually very clear of how the, the state in those supports actually engage with travellers in, in, in that very opening settings. So um, kind of my approach is going to be kind of slightly different because as, as a member of the community myself, I thought, um, like, rather than just picking a single topic, I might touch on the three of them, like the like, idea of culture, our heritage, and as well as our language, and I understand the language of the state as well as, as, well as our own responses. Because um, when because when John Cunningham first contacted me to do this, I thought, well, that could be really interesting, but also, it's colossal, do you, know? <laughs> like, do you know? And there's no way you could do it in six minutes, so it's how I just I have a sprinkle of my no, own understanding. Trust yeah. me, you okay. <laughs> so, um, so, so first, I actually wanted to start off with is actually to doing kind of an audit on ourselves, so I'm going to ask you three questions and allow yourself to be as critical and as open as, as possible for yourself. So the first question is, what do you actually know about travellers? What do you actually know about travellers? Like, have a sense of, like, what do you actually know about travellers, right? And the second question I need to ask you is, like, going, what is that source of that information? Is it, is it from a settled kind of narrative? Is it from settled uh, focused kind of research? Is it from community contact? Is it, is it from long-term community contact? Is it from a single exposure? Is it from that media outlet that you've read? Is it from Joe on the radio? Do you know? I mean, kind of going, what's the source of it? And also kind of going, have you gone through a process of community verification, which means checking your unconscious biases, actually looking at our history, looking and probing what the, what the both research and our history and our context is, and our own hesitations around each other. Because even one of the things that when I first sat here earlier today, I thought kind of going, even this room, right? Um, this room itself, and when travelers gather, we don't gather like this. Do you know, like when, when we come together, this, you know, this, so this is a very settled normative setting. So when we're here, we're still reaching out into a very settled, dominated uh, space to go, like hear us, listen to us, understand us. I think so when we're going through this process, I think we need, need to bear that in mind. And the next kind of thought that really resonated with me is that when we talk about discrimination, we are so easily thinking about the individuals, people, and individual actions. And we don't all kind of saying the structures themselves and the framework for itself is discriminatory and it's biased and it has the, the state in its processes and its legislation has attacked us, has diminished us. 
has they I mean even and as a response sometimes some of the I mean the historians I mean the the reply to some of the actions are very soft. If you think the 1963 report that was launched by Charlie Hawhey, like I, I know he, the words have said what the final solution to absorption, but the final solution, those terms, 20 years after Germany, mm -hmm. what, it wasn't like, and we look and we go, oh, he didn't mean it that way. Is it going, why, do, why are we so forgiving? You know, why are we so forgiving to kind of say, he didn't mean it that way? Because does that buy us off kind of going, because that fascism and that movement in Europe didn't happen in Ireland. You know, sure, we're, we're better than that. Like, we didn't go to those severe places. And I know, kind of growing up in a family where, like, my grandmother, I have a very distinct memory of her, her own mother telling her, if Ireland wasn't an island, they'd be dead. Do you know, and there was that sense of movement kind of going, that movement, that eradication, we were not immune to. And those practices, although we have survived and we have, like, we, can, we've been able to hold on to a certain degree of our, our, our sense of self, has been attacked and it continues to be attacked. Like, it's only five years ago where our um, ethnicity was acknowledged. You know? And it, and it kind of, because it was really new because the idea was it wasn't granted, you can't grant something like that, but it was finally kind of decided, yeah, they're a minority group, which we, all, we already knew already. And that was after study upon study upon study, including a lot of DNA research, which for myself is quite frightening, which is bioessentialism and it becomes quite dangerous. And we're also only three years um, ago where a judge throughout a discriminatory case that happened from a, someone getting denied entry into a, a, into a pub, a public house in Lucan, because the judge decided that the, the traveler who was challenging that establishment didn't look or sound like a traveler. And when I heard that, I thought going, this is not only just dangerous for travelers, this is dangerous for anybody who is protected by the equality law, where someone from the state, from the, like the, the other groups kind of saying, you know what, you're not, you no, know, you didn't fit our criteria of what you should sound and what you should look like, so you can't really be protected. So, so when we look, we're looking at what the state and how the state engages and then the history of it, like it's very important to look at the 100 years, but also look at the, the inheritance of those 100 years, and it hasn't just disappeared, you know? We are, like, the idea of the struggle for equality is, it's current, it's struggling, do you know? It's like we haven't arrived, do you know? And I just think that I just, I know kind of don't rant about it, but the whole thing is like, kind of going, I just want to really set out that, that tone and next is kind of, um, so we're looking at culture, and I, I find this discussion in the times around culture so very fascinating, because one of the questions that most travellers get asked is going, tell us about your culture. Do you, know, do you know? Go on, tell us about your culture. And I was kind of going, well, if I kind of going to tell you about my culture, I kind of have to understand your culture. Like, what's your sense of culture? Like, do you know, because the vast majority of people, when they talk about travel culture, they're actually talking about societal issues. Do you know, like, it isn't our culture no, to, to have accommodation crisis. It isn't our culture to have mental health crisis. It isn't our culture to have over 80% of people unemployed. Because um, if you look actually uh, kind of historically, like in the 1930s on the Dahl record, and there was a TD, a TD who proposed blood transfusions from travelers because there was such a high resistance to TB. We had very, uh, uh, I suppose, long life expectancies where there were highly industrial people. Do you know what I mean? Like, kind of, and, and those can engage us. So we can look at, we were these people that were a powerhouse of social change. We were very important. We were, we were a core part of Irish identity, is a part of, uh, of, of what Ireland was about, and has been systematically attacked. Because if you think about Travers, in kind of, if you put on those rosy glasses about who we are, people love our music, people love our crafts. Everybody, even the most, I come across people who are highly racist, love the old wagons. Oh, they go, oh my God, there's a wagon. <laughs> you know, the romanticism of it, right? Do you know, and they love that connection. They love our lore, they love our herbalism, they love our, kind of, our, our ability, our, kind of, our, our sense of crack, you know, the kind of, the, the, you know, that dynamism. They just don't love us. And a part of not loving us is that they don't know us, you know? Because when people look at us and look at our culture, they see the issues that society has brought. They don't actually look at us as a cultural people, sort of people of an expression with a history. And even that the whole debate around ethnicity, that was vile, you know? Because the whole thing is going to, and I mean that, that was an incredibly vile process. Um, because what you're doing is kind of going, we have to validate something that everybody in the room knew. You know, like going, going, like the idea of going, if you do all the things that the society tells you to do as a traveller, kind of going, get the education, stop being nomadic, you know, do all these things, you know, all this stuff, you're still considered a traveller. So there's this kind of vague and kind of preposterous idea of kind of going, no, we're, we're, we're debating it, and we're considering it, and you know, like, and just hold on there and tell me why you want it so badly. And you're kind of going, oh, you know, like it's, it was the state that was denying us. You know, and I think that process itself needs to be, like, not to be forgotten because the, the remem remembrance of that and the inheritance of that and the connections of that and how the state engaged us 
tells us a lot of the idea of like the, you know, the good poor. You know, mm -hmm. like, like if you if you're good enough and you behave well enough and you do all the things for us, we're considering saying that you're something that we all have admitted already. Mm -hmm. You know, and because I think about five years ago we were a social grouping while everybody ex accepted us as the othering group. You know, and kind of and even even like a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was at a, 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 actually, I was an online event around kind of Northern Ireland, and the topic of travels came up, and I thought this is really interesting because most people, when they think of the North, they think of this kind of duality of the, the Protestant and Catholics, you know, and how that there was other groups there, like travels were this other group, like kind of while having a inheritance from the, from, I suppose, from the Republic and the, you know, the whole history of the free state, but we're still seen as kind of there was these two main groups, and then there was this other group, you know, and there's other people in this other group, but we were the other group. I think that we need to actually bear that in mind, not just in these conferences, not just in these spaces, but also how we approach um, our community and in each other. Where is now? Can I, yeah, okay, sorry. I'm, I, you can tell loads of ideas, loads of thoughts. Um, trying to get it all in. Um, here we are now. Um, yeah, okay, okay. So next I'm going to talk about is um, language, right? So I uh, like, Mo Grass is half a tap of grass. So like, I have a love for language. And I think our, it is important that we maintain our language. And the state uh, in 2019, with a submission to UNESCO, um, intelligible rights, which means it, it has recognised that our language is a language that needs protection, is a language that needs prosperity, is a language that needs investment. And we know that it's an indigenous language, which means it comes from this island, so it's an Irish language, yet there is no support available for, for the teaching of it, for the recording of it, for the review of it, celebration of it. We have songs, we poets, we, we, poet, we, have, we have great insults, by the way, in the language. They're, you know, they're, they're fantastic. But even now, we're kind of thinking how even historically, when we're talking about Irish languages, um, like the idea of like my favorite thing is that people say it's a secret language, and the only time we say it's a secret language is when you're telling Sepik people, you know, because it's a secret. When in fact it's more of a closed um, language because of how we use it over time to be uh, as acts of protection, and acts of support, and acts of resistance. But like <laughs> Charles J. Leyland in the 1800s, like recorded. Master Green in his 30s was publishing in the Leinster Chronicle. It's out there, but the state is very aware of it, but even like, but historically has never put it as part of its legislation, never put it part of its of supports, never put it into the idea of its development of the Irish languages, even though it is a language of Ireland and the people of Ireland. And so I think that's something that's to be, be very considering of. And um, and even that kind of the idea of like how, how we, because one of the things again, the, how we speak to each other um, is so very different than how we speak to each other in the presence of, of settled people. So kind of these, again, kind of these spaces are, are us reaching out to form those connections. Um, and I just think that we need to be, <coughs> actually, so my favorite one is actually is how we probably realize that as a community, we have quite a quick pace of voice. Um, we are more we're recent to internalized spaces, so our, our octave of voice is quite high. And then sometimes when people feel very vulnerable in social spaces, we gather in groups. So sometimes when people who don't know will see a group, a loud, quick speaking group of people come down the road, they go, oh my God, that's so aggressive. Yeah? And because um, even when we actually, like one of the, my favorite comments among the community is like, sorry to cut across, yeah, sorry to interrupt, yeah. And it's like, it's constant because when we actually speak, if you think about traditional settings, we, we sit in circular spaces, which means the idea of this kind of, like, everyone takes a turn, you now it's your go. And it's your go, pile. When we're acting in our own settings, there's more fluidity of our voices and spaces. So when we're here, we're all going, this isn't, this isn't really kind of of my nature, or of my culture, or in my sense. We're all being very respectful, which is important, you know, all having spaces, but it does adjust how we engage with each other. And um, I'm very wary of times. So next, actually, just heritage, right? Just to throw out there, like one of my roles is the, and the Travel Culture uh, Collection Development Officer working with, I suppose, the creator of um, the collection of the National Museum. Um, now, the National Museum has been around for the of 100 years. It may, let's just say in that time, it might have 10 people um, just as a core working on specific things. So that's like, if you take 10 people for 100 years, that's 1,000 years of potentially creating and creating narratives just within that institution. And I, although I'm a member of that kind of institution and apply by them, I'm very critical of it because I think we need to be critical of our institutions because people who, who hold the history tell the story. And when I was doing an audit of, of the collections, I, I came across 118 items in the entire time of the, of, the four, of the four institutions of natural history, country life, art and design. You know, like only 118 items actually had been collected specifically about travellers. And, you know, and, you know, and out of those was a wagon from 1964, um, which was purchased by the museum via Garda 
mm. you know, on behalf of Trevor Woman, and I thought this is really interesting because they don't have the contact with the community, which the museum is, it has accepted, kind of going, we, they, if anyone's going to do the recording, it has to be members of the community. But it was no understanding of, isn't it suspicious how this wagon that was a home, a year after that program of the assimilation, they kind of suddenly a guard that sells the, uh, a home to the museum, and that wasn't critiqued or kind of going, that's a very unusual acquisition, you know? I think it's because it was people who were removed from us that they were doing that collection and doing that, that <coughs> narrative and doing the idea of this is what the state, the, the, an arm of the state, you know, they decided this is what we find interesting about Travers. Because out of those collections, that, like, the, like, we know we've had, like, a lot of it was like tinsmithery work, right, which is very important. But I always kind of did the idea of like, kind of going, people don't know us enough to realize that if three tinsmiths turned up at the same town, historically, no one's eating. So it was like we had other crafts and ideas. And there was no mention of women being tinsmiths, which I just found fascinating because there's a huge history of there. Because believe it or not, women can pick up hammers. <laughs> Shock, you know. <laughs> but also, there was nothing about religious identification, not about animals, not about women specifically, nothing around games. You know, it was the idea of going either you're a tinsmith or you have a wagon. You know, so there was this space with all these gaps in uh, uh, who you are. And I think that, like, if that has been allowed to happen for so long, or just in the process of kind of remedying it, we have a long way to go. And to go with that, we need to actually be very, very critical, but support are critical. Like, crit to critique is an attack, to say, that's a deficit, this is what we should do, this is how it works. And it's that simple, but the resistance around that is very interesting, you know, in ourselves and the people we engage with. And that's why I think we need to be challenging. Um, the very last one, okay, and then I'm going to shut Patrick. Uh, no, no, <laughs> right, uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, no. no. I, I okay. He said that I found it very interesting earlier for the gentleman, I can't, I can't just have it, I think he was talking about the, U, the UN um, the, the Council and how it, it, one of the intersectionalities around, um, I suppose, Traveller and Gypsies is LGBT. As someone for, who has that inter intersectionality, as someone who's, well, who was a Traveller and someone who's a, who identifies as a gay man, I came out in 20 years ago. Um, only this year have we been able to get the funding on a very temporary basis to employ someone to do that development work. So why would we say Traveller's are oppressed and removed and, this, and, the, and Ireland recognises that and Europe recognises that? The, the lines aren't being, aren't being connected very well. Do you know? And when they are connected, we're kind of going, well, it's a resource issue. And you're kind of, it's not a resource issue. <laughs> we can tell Ireland is quite rich. You know, Europe has the funds, structures. You know, but it's like kind of going, something about what you're saying is like going, you kind of have to be almost, when you behave well enough, and when, you, and when you've suffered long enough, and when you think you're so desperate, then we step in. Until then, we're kind of going to passively let you be punished by not putting these things into place by not actually stepping out, by not recording your history, or by recording, recording our version of it, yeah. you know, our version of how, or can we so gracious to do this for you, and did we step out, and yeah, and just, oh, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, go over to your test now, Robbie. <laughs> but you can tell, loads of opinions. Uh, oh. but yeah, thanks, yeah. Thank no worries. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> And, ju and just before I go to Robbie, because you, you answered, there was a couple of questions, but you answered them. But yeah. I just go back to the language uh, thing in relation to uh, when you spoke about it, um, the lack of resources, no resources, no state recognition, uh, uh, and no protection, promotion, preservation records, or, or recording of it now as we speak, uh, and so forth. But I just, and I'm going to, because we're going to Robbie, and he's going to have, a, he's going to be doing a kind of a, 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 we'll touch on some of this, I'm sure. But... If you look at, say, the Good Friday Agreement oh, mm. uh, and yeah. all of the debates that took place around the tables, and Bertie brings it up now and again when he's out and about on his way to become a president. <laughs> uh, but uh, he talked about the discussions around uh, Ulster Scots and, and, and uh, how that was a, a discussion in, inside in the debates. Well, Ulster Scots actually got funding under the Good Friday mm. Agreement. It receives funding. And if I'm correct, in some, in some parts of Antrim, if you go up there, you'll see the road signs with Ulster Scots, with English and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, Irish, I think, as well, maybe, to, to, for the minority that lives up there. But with Gammon Can Shelter, whatever it is we want to call it, Tory and Widian, uh, it is a language. Now, a little bit like defining us as a people mm. in, under the term itinerancy or defining us and erasing us, if you want to remove a people, you deny their language, you deny their, their, their place. So I think that's an, a key piece that we need to have addressed and, and it needs to be done uh, pretty soon. But now, on to you, Robbie. Thanks. You've got 
I have got 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know at this point because, no, we're at half 10, <laughs> uh, if get, I'm reading you, it right, so we've got loads of time. Shut me up whenever you want me to stop. <laughs> no, but we're kind of on to a really interesting point here that I can't let pass. As, as you think about the, 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 the significance of the, of the agreement and the fact that you're immediately presented with the reality that there's two states on the, uh, on the island of Ireland, not one, one of the commitments that the Irish government made in the Good Friday Agreement was that it would be a levelling up mm. of rights issues. Now, Trevor Ethnicity had already been recognised in law in the six counties before the Good Friday Agreement, and yet it still took 20 years of struggle to, 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 to catch up with that. So it's just one example of, of kind of the, the, the broader issues that I want to speak to. Um, uh, but I better get on with it. Uh, I, I suppose the first thing I should say is, having repudiated the uh, the, the, the title academic, because I'm not an academic, I am a researcher, so I have to hold up my hands. And Mags is right to to absolutely to ch challenge the you know the amount of research that has been done on uh, travellers with the uh, with the uh, the minimal positive positive. Uh, consequences of that. But I mean that that's what that's what I get paid to do. I'm a researcher. But also, I wanted to begin by remembering two heroes and, and, and friends of mine um, who passed during, co uh, during COVID because of, of, of anything useful to say here today. It's, it's largely because of things that I learned from them, and that's uh, Michael McDonough and Nan, Nan Joyce. But I also want to use them, and I think they would forgive me for it, for slightly rhetorically, because I think I want to make the point that they were not Southern Irish travelers nor indeed were they Northern Irish travellers, they were Irish travellers. They weren't defined by the state within which they lived. Uh, you know, with Nan, it's particularly obvious because she was an activist in Minker Michley. She did a lot of her activism in, in Dublin and other parts of the South. But when I knew her, she was living in West Belfast uh, and confronting the state in the North. And she, w she went to Stormont to take on the state before Gerry Adams and Sinn Féin did it from West Belfast. I mean, it's a, it's a unique history of of struggle from that community, from the heart of that community. So, you know, you're immediately reminded of the fact that, you know, they're, they're, you're not dealing with one state, but, 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 but two states. And it was true, slightly less, I guess, but in a, in a different way with Michael, because Michael actually came up to give the keynote address at the, conf the, f the conference that was finally pushing the, 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 the state in the north to recognize traveler ethnicity, and uh, it must have been about 96. And I remember after he spoke, people said, that's it over, but they can't deny Traveller ethnicity anymore after listening to this man, and they were right. So again, it was that, 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 uh, uh, that movement, North and South, is absolutely crucial to the, uh, to the understanding of Traveller's relationship with, with the state, but also to the, the politics that comes out of uh, uh, Traveller's traveler struggle. So the broader point I want to make uh, about that is that Neither of these people belong to this state, nor indeed to the northern state. And more generally, you, ha uh, uh, you have to acknowledge the truth that uh, has been made by many indigenous people around the world, particularly in America, is that, that, that travelers didn't cross the border and don't cross the border. The border crossed them. It was partition that crossed travelers. And it, uh, uh, it didn't change the, 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 the fundamental character of, of Irish travelers as Irish people who came from the whole of the, the, the island. Uh, and when, when Patrick first asked me to do this, I was very keen to kind of uh, make an intervention about the Northern State, um, because however bad the 26 county state was, the Northern State was just as bad. But I mean, I've kind of said that, and if we want to engage with that any, any, any further across the, uh, across the conference, I'm happy to, 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 to speak to anybody on that. But I mean, the, the kind of definitive um, observation on the way that travellers were constructed in the north was a was a, a B special commander. He said he defined he, said, he spoke about travellers as so-called gypsies who really are the scum of the free state. Mm -hmm. So the, the the construction of travellers in the north was both anti-Irish, anti-Southern, uh, and anti-traveller. And you know, uh, uh, things things have changed and improved to some extent as I implied in terms of the movement and ethnicity. But that's the reality of that state's response to its traveller population. And, uh, uh, and, and everything I want to say about the South is made in that context. So uh, I really wanted to, to then turn to speak to the, the, the Southern state uh, and to take, you know, the conference at face value in the sense that, it, that there's a genuine attempt to, uh, to reconcile, uh, to improve its relationship with its, with, it, with its traveler population. And I do that in a, in a kind of a, in a weird way because I, I, even though I live in Edinburgh, 
and I'm from the six counties. I am a citizen of a state, a state in the sense that it, it provides me with a passport. So it's, it, it is my state in that sense, although I've, uh, you know, I have a distance from it as well. So I suppose to, uh, uh, just to make a, a couple of observations to the state on that basis. Um, and the first thing to say is, as kind of I've touched on already, is that what we're addressing in this conference is addressed to the state. It's about the character of the state and, and, and the way that it, 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 it constructed and, and, and treated travellers. So it's not the whole of Ireland. It's not the Republic that was declared in uh, 1918, which would have been a 30-county uh, uh, Republic. It's the 26-county free state that emerged out of partition. And that's, it's not accidental that the character of the state that we've had to deal with over the last 20 years was, was defined by that moment. It was a partition state. It was not a republic, uh, but a free state, a, a white dominion, as I would characterize it, within, within empire. So you have to understand that, the, 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 that character of, of the state if you want to understand why we've had 100 years of uh, anti-travelism since. And that's just being honest about that. But I think if the state's serious about this project, it, it has to begin at that point. The second point is that in terms of re uh, conflict and reconciliation and dealing with the past, it's absolutely true. As this, the conference suggests that travellers need to be recentered uh, uh, in that narrative. Travellers have been part of the Irish Troubles from 1916 onwards. They were involved as victims, as survivors, and as active particip uh, participants at all stages of the, uh, uh, of the conflict. So they're part of the story. It's not that... Uh, Irish history happened and travellers were outside of it. They're part of, they're part of the conflict and they're, they're, they're part of the resolution of the, the, the conflict and pe peacemaking. Uh, and more generally, the conference is right in suggesting that the state, as well as its sociologists and its lawyers and its sociologists, has a speci uh, specific responsibility to recenter the traveller experience in academic and social research, as well as in state policy and practice. And then uh, the third point I want to make on that is in terms of reconciliation, uh, the, the recognition of the responsibility of the 26 county state raises what I think is a, an interesting and really crucial point. And this is to make the, the point that I, I think when you, when you talk about the nature of the state in Ireland, before 1922, uh, settled Irish people and travellers more or less had the same, certainly uh, settled Catholic rural travellers had, uh, or rural settled people, had more or less the, the same experience of the state. It was a hostile state. It was a state that had taken land from them. It was a state that most of the time, uh, uh, the, the, their best hope was that the state didn't engage with them at all. So it was a, it, the, the experience of the colonial state was not particularly different for travellers and, and, and non-travellers. So something really significant happens in 1922 in the sense that the, the state uh, in Ireland, or certainly in the 26 counties, changes its relationship with the settled population, but not with the travellers. Now, if you wanted to put that in, in, in sort of crude terms, what I'm suggesting is that, you know, the, the penal laws uh, uh, applied to all Irish people, or certainly all Catholic Irish people, up until 1922. Uh, that changed for settled, uh, settled Irish people after 1920, but continued for travellers. And that's why you get such a at this new development of, of, a, of an indigenous, if you like, anti-travellerism ex expressed through that state because the, the state has changed, not, necess not at all really in its relationship with travellers, but in its relationship to settled people. And that begins to explain some of the, 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 the narrative that, uh, that, that followed uh, over the last hundred years. So that brings me to a kind of Conclusion, I want to say a couple of things that, that, uh, that, that, that kind of point towards the, the future rather than dwell on the fa past. And the, the first point is that um, we definitely live in interesting times in terms of the, the, the state in Ireland. It is possible that, the, <coughs> that these two uh, partition states actually are coming to an end. And if that is the case, then it's really important that travellers are part of the process of deciding what replaces them. What kind of state do we want? Does it, does it look like the state that we were promised in terms of cherishing the, the, the children of the, the nation equally in 1916, the democratic republic that was, that, that was voted for by Irish people in 1918, or is it something else? But I'm also not a determinist, so I accept that lots of things could go wrong, like the North could vote for uh, an end to partition and you could all reject it down here. Uh, the British might repartition the North again <coughs> and, and, and invent an even smaller and, uh, 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 and more segregated Northern Ireland. So it's not inevitable that we're going to have this uh, this this moment of uh, uh, of reunification, but we're definitely in a in a, in a, in a point at a point of history where that that is, that is possible. 
But whether that is going to happen or it isn't going to happen, I just want to make the point that if, uh, insofar as I'm speaking to this state, it's really important that this state, uh, uh, if it's serious about treating its traveller citizens uh, equally and, and fairly, that it returns to the, 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 the core principle of, of 1916, what it, it still holds, holds to as the start of the, the, the decade of centenaries. And that's to say that if you are serious about cherishing the children of the nation equally, then you must start from this point onwards, as start with cherishing traveller children in that way. And that should be the litmus test for whether the state has, ha, has succeeded or failed in terms of what was promised in 1916. If you don't cherish the, the traveller children of this state equally, then you fail. And it's uh, an, a, 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 an appalling uh, pass that we've come to that if, if after 100 years we can't even begin to do that. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Robbie. And just before I, I give Vincent his, his, his moment as well, just in terms of your point there around uh, the possibility that we're going to have something anew or afoot in the coming years in relation to the two states. Um, and I don't think it's... I, I, I think it needs to be... The situation in relation to travellers just doesn't have a, a, a point in relation <coughs> to travellers. It, it needs to be... The state needs to take ownership if it's to prove that it can... Uh, look after and include and be inclusive of all its minorities, whether that's Jewish, uh, uh, Protestant, or indeed if the new, if there is the idea of a, a united Ireland, because it's a hundred years, and in that hundred years, I would say that the, that the stain on the Irish state, the Republic or the Free State, is the treatment uh, of, of of Irish travellers in terms of their legislative cleansing and. Uh, absorption and assimilation policy. So it's, a, it's beneficial for us all if they can come up and respond and actually address what, what has happened. So that's fantastic. Now, Vincent. Um, we've already uh, discussed the word itineracy, our itinerance. Um, and uh, I made the point that um, of the report itself acknowledges that travellers hated that and yet they continue to use it. Uh, throughout uh, throughout the report. The report was, I think, a watershed time in the, uh, from the traveller's perspective and indeed f from society's perspective in relation to the treatment of travellers. What it sought to do was to remodel travellers into being no longer travellers. That was the project that was undertaken. It was a, an, an, an arrogant exercise that in intrinsically belittled uh, travellers uh, above and beyond the belittlement which travellers had experienced uh, throughout the periods, uh, throughout the 40 years uh, of the state's existence. Um, a, f a central feature of uh, this project was that the membership of that commission had no traveller on it. And uh, this, is not, uh, this is not unique to travellers, incidentally. For instance, the Low Pay Commission has nobody on it that, is paid, uh, that, that earns low pay. They're all rich. And you wonder why they, the, this breakthrough moment that they've, um, uh, they've recommended that, tra that uh, uh, poor people get another 80 cent in their... Um, and that people who are low paid get, imp get an improvement of 80 cent in their pay. Um, this is, it's hardly surprising given the fact that there's nobody of low pay on the commission uh, itself. The chairman of the commission was Brian Walsh, who at the time was the Supreme, who at the time of the, the initiation of the commission was a high court judge and he later went on to be Supreme Court judge and much admired for the uh, protections that he found in the Constitution for people's inherent rights. And yet, this man allowed uh, or signed and participated in a project that um, was so belittling of a section of our community, it is, it is, um, uh, it, it is almost a, uh, inexplicable. 
throughout the report and how, he's, um, how he delivered the, uh, he was a parliamentary secretary at the time, and he delivered an address to the members of the commission um, uh, at the inception of the report, uh, inception of the uh, commission's, commission's work. Um, and th throughout his speech, and th throughout the uh, commission's report itself, travellers were viewed as a problem. Um, and from that perspective, they went on to, it's hardly surprising that they then wanted to obliterate travellers. Um, that the, the, a great deal of attention is given to the problem of trespass, to the, trouble, to the issue of begging. Like begging, uh, um, as though this is, was such a, an imposition in the popul population at large, even though the, the commission report itself acknowledged that without begging, people would have starved to death. Lots of children and others would have starved to death. Such was the poverty of the traveling community. There was a way of dealing with the issues that... Um, that traveller had at the time, for instance, dire poverty, for instance, unemployment, and for instance, uh, 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 being stigmatised. I said there's a way of dealing with that, for instance, by improving social welfare benefits. And by the way, a lot of travellers didn't get social welfare benefits because they were moving from place to place, and only people who had fixed addresses were entitled to social welfare benefits, which was an extraordinary um, uh, procedure in itself. Um, it wanted to, uh, begging was already outlawed, but they wanted to strengthen the laws against begging, even though this was the means of keeping people alive. They wanted to strengthen the laws against begging um, uh, and, uh, of course, against uh, trespass. Um, the trespass issue had mainly to do with farmers um, and with horses and donkeys that were owned by travellers, and they breaking into farmers' lands. And, but these were, again, integral to the lives of, of travellers. And so what if it infringed the private property rights? When did private property rights, or how, come, how can we believe that private property rights trumps the right to live? And for that was essentially um, uh, what this was all about. Uh, I think that that report was, like, from then on, uh, there was pressure to uh, house travellers. There was pressure to, but halting sites did be, uh, start to be constructed, though by no means enough um, because of the prejudice of the, of the population at large. By the way, the... the the report itself is, I think, 110 pages, and, two and a, three and a half pages are given to the settled community, who surely were the problem. Uh, and, and even then, there was only a single paragraph out of 24, I think, in that chapter, uh, dealing with um, the failure of the settled community to accord, to, uh, to accord uh, Christian uh, equality to, uh, to travellers. But it was, so, uh, and this is true of Hawhey's speech as well, it was just an afterthought. That, oh, by the way, yes, yes, they're entitled to uh, be regarded as equal, equal citizens and all that. Yeah, yes, 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 of course, yes, that's right. But let's move on. Uh, was the, was the tone of all that. There was a, a uh, sociologist uh, called Michael McGreal. Um, he was a Jesuit priest. He was a priest. Anyway, maybe it's unfair to call him Jesuit. But, um, uh, but he, um, he did a number of reports on att which dealt with attitudes to various phenomena, but also attitudes to travellers. And uh, one of the depressing features of his reports was that, if anything, uh, the antipathy to travellers deepened over the years, particularly with regard to whether 
travellers would be welcomed into a family, if somebody married a traveller, and also whether travellers would be welcomed as next-door neighbours. Um, some of you will recall, uh, uh, Aoife went on about Joe Duffy a lot. <coughs> I just want to make a brief mention of Pat Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to do with the presidential debate, and the last presidential debate, which was five years ago, wherever, um, and a fellow called Peter Casey uh, was, one of the, was one of the candidates, and he was uh, virulently anti traveller But Pat Kenny asked the following question, uh, and he asked each of the candidates to answer the following question, and it was, would you be happy if a traveller moved in next door to you? Now, just think of if, if it was, would you be happy if a, a Jewish person uh, lived, came to live next door to you, or a, a black person came in, or a, a gay person came in, or, a, or whatever. The, and, and there was no howl of outrage any, at any stage, uh, uh, from any quarter with regard to that question. I thought it was just shocking. I also was disappointed, incidentally, that nobody said to him, well, I'd prefer a traveller to move in to me than you move in to me, <laughs> <laughs> given his, his record in dealing with his own neighbours. <laughs> <But, laughs> um, uh, over the years, I've, I've happily made friends with travellers, uh, principally through Michael Collins and, and uh, his wife, Joyce. God, what's that for? What? Catherine Jack, Jesus, how could I forget? God, I hope nobody's related to him here. Please don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I got introduced to the travel community, uh, mainly towards them. And I was practicing for a while as a barrister, and I represented a traveler, a fellow called John Collins, uh, John Collins, uh, who uh, sought to uh, have a pub in Finglas. Uh, denied a renewal of license because he was refused service there because he was a traveller. And the a case uh, uh, f uh, focused on whether he was present during a row in the pub involving a lot of travellers and uh, evidence was given by uh, two Garthi who came to the site who were absolutely adamant that he was present. Uh, I showed a photograph of photograph to the Garthi and asked them, was this the person who uh, uh, was present, that you say was present? They said yes. And that wasn't uh, John Collins. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, some of the staff of the pub gave evidence saying that he was present when this frack occurred, and the owner of the pub was pre who, um, who was not present, but said she knew about it, what had happened, and she was uh, absolutely certain he wasn't present. But then the manager gave evidence, and he said, I told the people involved in the frack that John would be very outraged by the behavior of the people who were engaged in the fracas, which proved that he wasn't present. This is the manager of the pub who was present at the time. So I thought, yes, that's the game set match now. That's it. No, the judge uh, not alone refused the application to deny a license, but also singled out the one person who gave evidence that told the truth, namely John Collins. And, and he said, it's a, he, he wanted to comment on the perjury perpetrated by John Collins, he being the only person who, told, who didn't perjure himself in giving evidence. And I thought that if the judiciary is as biased as this person clearly was, I nearly said something that would deny him, <coughs> would identify him, and he's the sort of fellow that would pursue you to the ends of the earth. <coughs> so i uh, glad I missed that. You know <coughs> Uh, but uh, but it was a it was a, a revelatory moment that that uh, 
um, that I think said a lot about the institutions of the state and by those who hold significant office in the history of the state. One further point about uh, a fellow called John Ward. That's his first name, wasn't it? John Ward. Uh, who, traveled, who was killed by a farmer called Patrick Nally in Mayo 10, 15 years ago. And uh, the, um, the state, uh, I was in Mary Cassidy's state, what was it? Pathologist. Um, said that he was killed by a gunshot to his head while he was crouching down and the person who shot him was standing over him and shot him at close range. And um, Patrick Nally, in his own evidence, uh, said that uh, he, had, he had beaten um, John Mort almost to death. He said, like a badger, you couldn't kill him. And John Mort, having been really badly beaten by Patrick Nally, having done nothing, by the way, he did have a history of, of criminality, but he had done nothing to Patrick Nally at all. And John Ward staggered out on the roadway, and Patrick Nally went to an outhouse, got a gun, and came out and shot him dead and threw his body over a, a wall. Now, in my view, by no stretch of the imagination could the defense of provocation have been appropriate because John uh, uh, Ward did nothing to him. Uh, and yet, in the first trial, um, he was found guilty only of manslaughter. Uh, but it was better than what happened later. Um, then it went to the Court of Appeal, and the appeal court found that the judge should have allowed the jury to bring in a verdict of not guilty. Or the, the judge had said, well, on the evidence, you, you can't bring in a ver verdict of not guilty for it. It's quite clear, even according to Patrick Nally himself, he shot the guy, he killed the guy, uh, uh, and the provocation isn't sufficient to, to have uh, deem, to deem that as, uh, as a, a manslaughter. Um, so there was a second trial, and he got off in the second trial. There were three Fine Gael TDs in that constituency at the time. Uh, Michael Ring, who was still around, Jim Higgins, who was not still around, and Andy Kenny, who was not still around. And two of them, um, Michael Ring and uh, Jim Higgins, joined in the celebration of the, ver the not guilty verdict in the second trial. And Ender Kenny didn't quite join that, but he made a speech at the time, or made it, wrote an article in one of the newspapers at the time, uh, advocating uh, for the leniency be given to people who react against travelers in such circumstances. And uh, again, there was no outrage. Uh, in the country as a whole about what had happened. And I was critical of the traveler community at the time, and Rosalind McDonough was very critical of me in, re in response, uh, that the traveler community didn't rise in outrage over, over that incident. But uh, I suppose a community that is beaten um, by tradition, and by the state and by society, I could be forgiven for, for not doing so. In any event, that's what I've got to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>
people want to throw a few questions, maybe have a bit of a conversation as well, we, we have about 10 minutes. But just hold your horses there, Bernard. Uh, <laughs> that hand goes up. I knew you were going to get it up, but you get your chance. Uh, uh, just a quick response to, to Vincent there, just about your criticism or your questioning of the, of the travellers at the time in relation to, uh, in relation to uh, the situation around um, John Ward and, and, and the whole case. I mean, if you look, and I, I, I'm not the only one, others have said this uh, a lot more learned than I, and indeed uh, travellers, uh, we're a tiny population. We've had the state apparatus since the formation of the state uh, pointed at us. They've introduced legislation from as early as 1925 to as late as 2002 that have all have an anti-traveller element uh, in it, uh, directly designed and ethno-profiling to some extent. The likelihood of, 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 of travellers being able to um, respond, let's just say in any real meaningful way, we don't have the numbers to be a physical force, we don't have the numbers to be a threat to the state, uh, we never, we, we, politically we're not all that much uh, cohesive in ourselves or, or, or collective-wise. So I think the best we can do uh, is, is to, in, in incidents like that, is to kind of stay quiet to some extent, or stay uh, below the radar. Uh, traveller organisations and traveller allies and us have raised it, but realistically we wouldn't have a snowball's chance. Uh, uh, and I'm just thinking about, you know, when you look at that incident and look at Alabama, look at the Black Lives Matter, all of that, the similarities, and then of course if you go up north as well. So just on that point, and I, I, believe me, Vincent, I, I there's times we all want to rebel. Uh, uh, now, so I'm going to leave it open to uh, people. So, um, so Bernard, now I'm going to. We have about we have about less than ten minutes, so we just got a one or two questions. Okay, one question. Yeah. Can you hear me again? I can yeah. indeed. Okay, uh, just two quick points, and I covered the rest of my talk later on. One on itinerants. There was a Germanic word. It was uh, itinerant courts. So there was a tribe of people who would move around. That's where the word itinerant came from. It was used um, in the 1963 report differently. Vincent Brown pointed absolutely spot on. Travel organizations should have been outraged. There should have been protests. Yeah. If you remember, Patrick, I was on yeah. the National Airway yeah. at that time, yeah. shouting, yeah. screaming, the yeah. whole lot. But there was when outrage, When we pushed Bernard. it a bit further to yeah. go to the court, sorry. We had live lines. Yeah. Um, it was actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. actually it, was on, it was on the Vincent Brown show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was on a couple of shows like that. But okay. basically what happened yeah. was, when we went to the court, because we wanted to cause a okay. bit of a more over uproar, because yeah. even during the court, there were single travellers to one side, settled to the other side for this court case. So we wanted to go there and protest. And then we were threatened with legal action that if we mentioned the traveller organisation that we we're a part of, we would be brought to court despite being on the management. So again, the state was, uh, was oppressing those who were trying to raise the voice. So Even again, traveller organisations yeah. and traveller allies were being, being, being uh, held uh, differently or treated differently. Martin, there's a mic there for uh, yeah, you. Thanks, Patrick. I, yeah. I just have to take issue with that. And I've heard this being said before mm. with that mm. uh, incident with Parignali and John Ward. And mm. traveller organisations, certainly Pavi Point, and others, to be fair, ITM as well, and the Women's Forum, we did react, we did protest. Mm. We were outside the court protesting. Mm. We are outside the doll protesting. Mm. We are on various media programs. And I've been very, very clear and very consistent. Mm. It was a case of cold-blooded murder. Mm. Uh, and he, got, it, and it, he was, got away with murder, as simple as that. Now, I don't know what degree of outrage or uproar people would be happy with or satisfied with. But it's not correct to say that there wasn't outrage in the no. community. There was outrage yeah. in the community. And we could see the manifestations of that with the different protests, demonstrations, and travellers being on the media. Mm. Mm. It was cold-blooded murder. Yeah. yeah, no, and I would agree, Martin. Uh, I mean, the question is, because I, I do remember there was, there was outrage. There was outrage and there was fear among the community as well, never mind outrage, that the fact that what happened, and then to, to, during the appeal uh, process and what came out of that, and to witness, just, you, you, you raised Vincent there about senior political heads and individuals. I mean, uh, Andy Kenny went on, if I'm right, to become the Taoiseach, uh, not whatever, a couple of years after that, isn't that right? Uh, and, and all of that. So people that were in, in very prominent positions of influence and power 
were, and at the time as well, the GA supported uh, the, the cause down in, in Mayo as well. So just whole society and, and the institutions of the society. But you're right, Martin, there was outrage and there was at least, but just the point that Bernard was making as well, I think we need to, we, we to recognise if, 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 the, if the ability was to kind of hold and, and, and threaten that there'd be legal, uh, legal uh, cases taken against us or against representatives or whatever, then that's an issue and that's at a state oppression directly. So, anyone else? Hi. Um, just There's just, to uh, sorry, Mag, just... Sorry. Uh, just, just Could you give your name maybe? And we I'm can. Orla Egan with the Cork LGBT Archive. Um, and it Orla, just, is it? Orla. Yeah. And um, it's just, again, it, thanks to everybody for fabulous papers and presentations this morning. But again, following up that case around John Moore's murder and how that was responded to, it strikes me as having huge similarities to how the murder of Declan Flynn was dealt with by the Irish courts, yes. the gay man who was killed in Fairview Park. And once again, in that situation, his murderers were given, got off because it wasn't seen as being a real issue because they were kind of doing a service to the state by getting rid of this gay man and gay bashing was justified. So I think the similarities in terms of how the state has reacted to the murder of people that they don't value is very similar. But I think one of the things that's really interesting is how the LGBT organizations and the travel organizations came together and particularly in the 90s in terms of campaigning for equality legislation and equal status legislation and organizations like Harvey Point and various kind of LGBT organizations working together to make sure that travelers and LGBT people were included in that legislation. Hmm. Yeah, no, I'd can agree. I just respond with this? Because yeah, no, ju I'm just, go, just yeah. so you want to respond. Yeah, um, no, just, just to acknowledge, like next year um, is 30 years from the decriminalization of homosexuality in this state. And there will be events and there will be associations and people in Ireland clapping his hands, his, raw, his back is raw, all the back clapping. And to be a traveller, we're called travellers, nomadism is effectively illegal since 2001. And I don't understand how people don't draw those lines of, of connection, of how we went forward to your identity as LGBT people, as Dino, it will be decriminalized and it's very important, mm. you know. At the same time, we are, we, we be, we are called travellers and where our ability to travel in, in a nomadic state is uh, still, today, illegal, you know, effectively. So I just think that that needs to, I mean, to really to, uh, to draw those lines because why it can be champion some people when they come the right to good and they come the right to the poor people, it doesn't always uh, extend itself to, to others. Mm. Uh, could, I just, could I just reply briefly to Martin Collins? Uh, I don't recall the uh, response of him under Pavi Point at the time, um, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen, and I'm sure uh, that Martin is, is telling it as it was. And I just want to acknowledge that the great work done by Martin himself in, on behalf of Travellers and mm. uh, of Pavi Point as well. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Down the back, Bernard. Bernard Joyce. Thanks, Patrick, and really um, welcome the panel discussion and also recognizing that, um, you know, that it's obviously really important. Um, but I just want to ask the panel, just briefly as we come to kind of an end, that the question was really about the outrage opposed. And there's really a bias in that kind of, you know, scenario. And the question I'd be asking, why wasn't there not an outrage in terms of the killing, you know, of um, John Ward? Why wasn't there not an outrage in terms of Carrick Mines? And is it that, you know, that, as travellers would say, it's, it, you know, it is a form of normalisation of racism in an Irish context. So I just want to put that to the panel in terms of, you know, and for people in the room. Is that kind of acceptable? Is that kind of a normalised? And that's hence why we're not getting the outrage from others in terms of outspoken, in terms of situations as they arise. Graham. So that's to the panel. Robbie, you want to respond? Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is, and it's, it's something I, I should have said much more explicitly, is that the, the spectre of genocide hangs over all discussions of travellers and, and, and Roma in the state across Europe. And, that's, and, and, and you, can, you can kill a people with Nazi methods, where you use concentration camps, which in passing, I should, should mention, were discussed by the Stormont government and the, uh, when they turned to the issue of how to deal with travellers after the Second World War, three years after the... The, the, the end of the, the Paramus, the people thought it was okay to talk about concentration camps for travellers in, in the north. 
But you can also do it with a smile. You can do it through policy. You can do it through um, a, a, a commitment to modernization. And that's, that's where that, that genocide begins to connect with that, that, the Commission of Itinerary. Because it's not an accident that he used final solution as a no, term. No, it's not, absolutely. Once you've constructed a whole people as a problem, then the best thing you can do, the most sensible, logical thing you can do, is get rid of them. So that, you know, that the, 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 there's the genocide that the Nazis did, which we all understand in terms of killing people, but there's killing people through taking their kids into care, uh, uh, th through making it impossible to live their lives legally. Uh, 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 and in, uh, in that sense, the only way to understand why lots of Irish people think it's okay to murder travellers because the state said we should get rid of these people. That's what the commission was about. It's like a good solution to this problem would be to have no travellers left. So at that point, individual murder and genocide by the state are not two separated things. They're just different, different parts of the same policy. Now we've got... <laughs> we've got a few seconds, literally. Leon, do you want to... No, I'm, I think I fill yeah. the air enough. Aoife? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just think outrage is a really unpredictable thing as well in a media space, and it's getting probably more unpredictable because of the various forms of social media that feed back into traditional media. And outrage to me, like, it has no relationship to the, the horror of the original act, almost. Mm. There's an awful lot of outrage happens around very, very small things, and then huge things get ignored. And so it's it's a really peculiar thing that something that it, to me is completely obvious when someone is murdered that it's an outrage that that can be yeah. passed over. Um, and it is just unfortunately part of the feature as well of the media landscape yeah. and of public outrage. Yeah. Yeah. Vincent, are you? Uh, just one point about the uh, report. Uh, it, it expressed regret that uh, the presence of travelers begging um, in front of tourists was damaging the tourist trade. I know. So there was an image thing there. And, and look, I, I've only got about 30 seconds or so, so we're going we're gonna to leave. I can't. <laughs> you, you, you connected to me. Um, so I, I just want to respond. I'm going to quickly say, because we need to get across, and Owen has given me the eye a number of times there, <laughs> and, and not a good eye. Um, I want to just respond to the begging thing. When Geraldus Comprensis came over here in, uh, in 1170 or 1171, yeah. uh, and he wrote his couple of works on the Irish, Gerald of Wales. Yeah. He noticed that all the Irish the, the, uh, uh, were riding around on horseback, you know, going from A to B, you know, all over the place. And he said, even the beggars beg from horseback. Do you understand what I'm saying to you there? There was a little bit of uh, no. a kind of... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it to you later. The point I'm making, the point I'm making, the, uh, the point I'm making here as well is that um, outrage or the lack of outrage from white settled sedentary Irish society. Uh, I mean, they've had a hundred years of desensitizing the population with the language of othering and oppression, the language of oppression. And as Haig Vazimajan wrote, when you, when you use language of oppression, you, you, the next, the only most obvious step after that is to kill or to, out, uh, to wipe out those that you have uh, derided or are humiliated or oppressed. And I think that's exactly what, if when we look to the Commission on Itinerancy, but we look at the previous 40 years from, from 22 up until 61. Someone said earlier on, it was only 20 years uh, after the Wanzi conference where the final solution to the Jewish problem or the Jewish uh, issue was first uh, muted. Charles Jehahi, as you well know, Vincent, and you did a lot in relation to them, uh, was an old stupid man. Uh, so uh, anyone that says that they, they weren't aware of what the final solution was about Brian Walsh, as you said, High Court judge at the beginning of the Commission on High Tenerance. By 63, he was, he was a, a Supreme Court judge and, as you said, went on to become heavily involved in others. So I'm just making those, but these were not gullible, uneducated, uh, uh, isolated people on the island of Ireland. They were well aware of the international context in terms of the uh, post-World War II. But anyways, I'm going to just finish off with that. Sarah, I agree. So I'm glad it's opened up. So... Let's go for it, and Sarah's going to tell you where to go, and uh, we'll get the debate going. Can I get, can I get your number? Oh,